Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Teacher Development Webinars. Thanks for joining us. Teacher Development Webinars is a full selection project to support teachers and educators around the world with professional development opportunities. It is an initiative using the rise in online professional development to connect people from around the world with opportunities that they may not have had due to old normal of face-to-face -face conferences. And today I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Scott Thornbury for this uh, webinar. Scott Thornbury is a teacher and teacher educator with over uh, 40 years of experience in English language teaching and MA from uh, the University of Reading. And recently he taught on the MA TESOL program at the New School in New York. His previous, uh, his previous experience includes uh, teaching and uh, teacher trainer in Egypt, UK, Spain, where he lives, and in his native New Zealand. His writing credits include uh, several award-winning books for uh, teachers on language and methodology, as well as authoring a uh, number of papers and book chapters on language and language teaching. Uh, Scott is a series editor of the Cambridge Handbooks for Teachers. He was also the co-founder of a Dogma ELT group. You can find out more about him at his website, www.scottsunbury.com. What a player it is to have you at Teacher Development Webinars, Scott, especially on, uh, you know, uh, today when it's my birthday. Thank <laughs> you so very much. Many happy returns. That's an honor, know. privilege. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's great to be happy birthday. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you how old you are. I suspect you're a little bit younger than me um, and haven't been working 40 years in ELT like I have. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, it's um, uh, it's a, a, a great thing that you're doing with the teacher development webinars, uh, and I'm proud to be able to uh, participate. And I'm judging from the chat comments we've got people from a wide range of countries time zones um teaching contexts i imagine and um i'm going to try and address a topic which i hope will have some relevance in your particular context if you've followed my talks and webinars before you may be familiar with some of my particular uh interests and concerns and one of them is uh, in the area of um, classroom discourse, what we can call. So, uh, Amanala, are we ready to go? Sure. Take us away. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's just take that to the beginning. So we've got about, uh, we've got an hour uh, just under, and I want to allow some time for question and answers at the end. So drop your questions into the chat. Uh, and Amanala, if I don't catch them, he will catch them and we'll, I'll try to address them uh, at the end. Uh, so let's get going. I just want to tell you a little story. I'm a teacher trainer, uh, or teacher educator. I work with, uh, or have worked with, new teachers, that is to say, uh, on uh, pre-service courses and on uh, in-service courses with experienced teachers, including the Cambridge Delta uh, course, which some of you may be familiar with, an in-service course. And uh, I worked with a colleague for many years here in International House Barcelona, where I live, uh, on these courses. Uh, these Delta courses with experienced teachers uh, in a very lively uh, language school. And uh, my colleague on these courses, Neil, was telling me one day that he was on the, uh, he had to substitute for a teacher who was absent. Yeah? So as well as teacher training, we were also teaching and he had to substitute. He had to take the class of a teacher who was absent. So he took the class and he did it in this characteristic way uh and um that was fine it was just one a one-off class a few weeks later he met one of the students on the train while he was traveling back to his uh village and she said to him oh are you going to come back and teach our class again 
Uh, and he said, no, that was just a one-off. That was just because your teacher was sick. And she said, oh, that's a pity. Uh, and he said, why? And she said, our teacher, our present teacher, is very nice, but she never... <laughs> I want you to just imagine what she said, complete the sentence. Our teacher is very nice, but she never, yeah, Amir. <laughs> Arena, she never listens to it. She never let us talk. She never stops talking. She never allows us to talk. Okay, she never helps us. <laughs> Yes, she never answers our questions. She never creates a friendly environment. She never, she never, she never corrects our mistakes. Could be any of these things, but in fact, uh, it was Amir right at the beginning who got it right. Uh, so this is what she uh, said. She never talks to us. And Neil' reaction to this was kind of like. Well, that's kind of sad. Um, it's a bit like saying, you know, my 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 wife is very nice, but she never talks to me. Or my children are very nice, but she never talks to me. Uh, they never talk to me. Uh, it just seemed in a language class, particularly the idea of a teacher not talking to the students was something that uh, he found difficult to understand. But of course, it's what happens. And I want to show you another example, which some of you will have seen. Uh, I'm sure this is taken uh, in a classroom in Mexico where the teacher has just beginning the lesson. Yeah, He's just taken uh, uh, the register. Yeah, He's just checked who's present and he starts chatting uh, to the students. And he says to one uh, student, well then, Jorge, did you have a good weekend? Yeah? And Jorge says, yes. And the teacher, what did you do? And the student, Jorge, says, I got married. And the teacher says, oh, you got married. You certainly had a good weekend then. Pause. There's laughter from the other students and a buzz of conversation. And then the teacher says, now turn to page 56 in your books. You remember the last time we were talking about biographies, etc." And the teacher checks the book and the lesson plan while the other students talk to Jorge in Spanish about his nuptials, about his wedding. So you see, this seems to be a classic example of what happens when the teacher doesn't engage with what the learner, so the teacher asks questions, but doesn't really respond in a uh, human way. That is to say, uh, he or she responds as a teacher and changes the subject back from Jorge's marriage to page 56 of the book, which is presumably more intense. Now, I'm not criticizing this teacher. I'm just saying this is what happens. This is what happens. Uh, a lot. And I'm going to show you another example in a minute of a similar kind of thing. Um, but the, and there's a lot, we can go into this in some detail, but I'm not going to now why, in fact, the teacher thought page 56 was more important than Jorge's wedding. It may be that uh, they have an exam next week and it's on page 56, or uh, that Jorge speaks a lot in class anyway, and therefore, you know, she, she, the teacher's not going to indulge him any more. But this is, I think, a, a problem we all face as language teachers, that sometimes opportunities for real conversation come up and we don't really know how or whether we should even uh, indulge them. That is to say, whether we should take advantage of them. And this has been the subject of a lot of interest in the research and to classroom discourse. Um, and as one writer says, uh, it seems that traditional classroom environments do not lend themselves very well to conversation. It's not something that fits into a traditional classroom, conversation, real conversation, because by definition, the classroom is a formal, institutional, institutional and asymmetric setting. In other words, there's a power differential between the teacher on the one hand and the students on the other, particularly if they're children. Um, and uh, she goes on to say, paradoxically, in this setting, the informal, unpredictable, spontaneous conversational act interactions, which should lead to communicative competence, have to be accommodated. So Jorge's wedding, which is informal, unpredictable, spontaneous conversational interaction, needs to be accommodated, she argues, this writer. 
uh, if language learners are going to be engaged and the communication is going to take place. And if you think about it, you know, if you think about another skill, like, for example, learning to swim, which of way would be best way of learning to swim than these two pictures? This one or this one? Yeah, and I would think probably unanimously you would say the second picture is the best way to learn to swim. Uh, you get in the water and you do it. I mean, obviously, uh, you have some assistance, etc. But trying to do it on dry land is pretend swimming. And just as trying to talk in the classroom when you don't have real conversations, that's pretend language learning. Yeah, the best way of learning a language is by doing it. So let's have another look, uh, a look at another um, conversation or piece of classroom talk uh, where there is a lot of talk, there's a lot of interaction, but there's not necessarily any real swimming. Uh, and this was a, a, an assignment that on our Delta courses, we set the candidates. They had to record a piece of their classroom talk yeah, and then analyze it to see how communicative it is is. So this is the piece of talk. I had to read it through with you. It's a bit always difficult to, to read transcripts of classroom interaction, but I'll do my best. So this is the situation. It's an upper intermediate class. These are young adults uh, in Spain. They have just read three texts in the course book, three texts about the musician Phil Cotton. This shows you how old this is. Uh, so the course book has a text or three short texts about Phil Collins. And then the teacher starts asking questions. So she says, OK, look at the last text on the sheet that Kathy gave you. Or maybe it's not in the course book. It's on a it's been printed photocopy. What's it about the last text? So the Kathy is the preceding teacher. Yeah, they're doing a teacher practic practice class. So this teacher is taking over and she says, look at the last text on the sheet that Kathy gave you. Okay, what's, the, what's it about the last text? The last text was a student, says a student, the teacher says, who is it about? Another student says, it's about Phil Collins' life. Yeah, it's about Phil Collins. Um, so what does Phil Collins do? One student says, singer. Another student says, plays drums, I think. The teacher says, he's a singer and he plays drums, is another. He's a singer and he plays the drum, so he's a drummer. He's a drummer. Okay. Does he sing well? Says the teacher. Does he sing well? Is he a good singer? Some students, yeah, yeah. One student says, no. Ah, so you think so, yeah, but, uh, but you don't. That student says, no. Okay. <laughs> so is he a good drummer? Says the teacher. Does he play the drums well? Yes, yes. Do you think that when he was a child, he used to practice a lot? Did he practice a lot? Yes. Where did he practice? As students say, at home, did he practice a lot? Did he practice a lot? Yes, yes. How do you know? How do you know? How do you, we read it before because he's very good. So what does it say in the text, says the teacher? Always playing. Huh? Always playing drums. Yeah, again, he was always playing the drums, says the student. And the teacher, he was always playing the drums, okay? He was always playing the drums. Everybody, say it. He was always playing the drums every day, all the days, all the time, every day, all the time. Yeah, always good. OK, so you, you kind of get the idea. This is a typical kind of question and answer routine uh, following on from a text. Uh, where you could argue that, oh, well, this is good. The te there's a lot of interaction. The teacher's keeping the students busy. Uh, the teachers, she's not lecturing to the students. Uh, she's keeping them involved and engaged, uh, etc. But when you look a little bit more closely at this, you can see that it's uh, it's pretend conversation, isn't it? It's like pretend swimming. It's not real conversation. It's not the kind of conversation people have in the real world. Now, in this project on this course, we asked the teachers, having transcribed a little section of their classroom language like this, to analyze it in terms of its communicativeness. Because after all, all these teachers were subscribed to a view of language learning, which we call notionally the communicative approach. So is this real communication? And this is what she said when she wrote uh, an analysis of this. Um, she said, virtually all the questions are display questions. 
which accounts for the tiny amount of real communication and student talking time. Just let me stop there and uh, check we understand what an display question is. So if you look at these two questions, A and B, how many fingers have I got? Uh, how many brothers have you got? What's the difference between those two kinds of questions? Do you want to post um, your opinion in the chat? What's the difference between A and B? Amir, A is completely inauthentic compared to B. Yes, it's not the sort of question you were asked in the real world, is it? How many fingers have I got? The second engages students is Cynthia, absolutely. Okay. Okay, yeah. So you've got the idea that there's a distinct, the qualitative difference. Um, and what the, in the literature on classroom discourse, what the first question is, is an example of what's called a dis display question. Yeah? It's a display question because it's asking the learners to display their knowledge. Yeah? In this case, the numbers from one to five, presumably. How many fingers have I got? Five, good, okay? So that's, the teacher knows the answer. Yeah? The teacher knows the answer, but he or she is checking that the students can uh, answer the question and use the relevant language. Yeah? So that's why it's called a display question. Whereas uh, question number two or B, how many brothers have you got? We're assuming that the teacher doesn't know the answer. So this is a real question. How many brothers have you got? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's a difference, therefore, between these typical classroom questions and a real question. And of course, these happen in not just in language classrooms, but in all kinds of class classrooms. So, for example, um, what's the capital of Brazil? Um, and the answer, I know the answer because I'm the geography teacher, yeah? but I'm testing that you do. Or what's a three-sided shape, a triangle, etc. So in, in any class, these are typical kinds of questions. And they come in a particular kind of sequence as well. So you look at this sequence from the text we just read, Who's it about? Now, the teacher knows the answer, but she's checking. It's about Phil Collins' life. Yeah, it's about Phil Collins' life. So what we have here is a typical three-part uh, exchange, which is labeled in the literature, initiate. You know, the teacher initiates, the learner responds. And in the third move, the teacher gives some kind of feedback. Yeah, and elaborates. It's about Phil Collins. Yeah, What's the capital of Brazil? Brasilia. Good. Yeah, that would be the same kind of thing. So traditionally called an IRF uh, exchange. IRF, initiate, respond, feedback. Very, very typical of classrooms. So anyway, there she goes. This is um, my student, and she's continuing. She says, virtually all the questions are display questions, which accounts for the tiny amount of real communication student talking time. Most of the questions are about something both the teacher and the students have already read. Yeah. So it says checking, 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 checking. The only examples that could possibly be construed as being real questions are, is he a good singer? Is he a good drummer? Yeah. So that is a, a question about a, opinion. Yeah? What do you think? Um, but the text that I've just read clearly considers that Phil Collins is a good singer and drummer. So it's unlikely that the learners are going to respond authentically to that question. They're just going to play along. Yeah. Uh, although one student does, in fact, say no, and she could have picked up on that, but she ignores that. Yeah. So this is the teacher's own evaluation of her lesson. And she's quite tough on herself because, in fact, this is a very typical kind of lesson. But you could argue that this is pretend language. Yeah, It's pretend talk. It's not real talk. And therefore, it's not real practice. Uh, the language used establishes a pattern of human communication which gives only the illusion that learning is actually occurring. It's an illusion, according to this particular writer. So this is the kind of, this kind of Phil Collins conversation or exchange is sometimes what's called recitation teaching. Recitation teaching is where it's like students are 
reciting. It's a very teacher fronted. Teacher asks all the questions, uh, and uh, there's a high proportion of display questions, as we saw. There's little wait time. That is to say, the questions come bang, 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 bang. There's little uh, time for students to formulate a response. And there is this evaluative follow-up. Good, right, okay. Yeah, and that third move. And it's often directed at some pre-selected teaching point. If, we, if you remember with the Phil Collins text, what the teacher was trying to get them to was the sentence, he was always playing the drums, yeah? When she finally got him them there, he was always playing the drums, then she had them repeated. So that was her teaching point, yeah? That's what she was heading for. That's what this question and answer routine was directed at. Um, some studies have been done of classrooms have shown that on the whole, uh, this is an example from Canada, uh, they looked at classroom talk and they found that um, two of the most striking figures of this analysis were that teachers asked almost all the questions, very few questions asked by students, and students were rarely given sufficient time to formulate their answers. Yeah, so little wait time. Uh, another study reported by Amy Tsui, her, her own study, this time in Hong Kong, Found, finds virtually the same thing that most in most English second language classrooms, a major part of the interaction is generated by the teacher asking questions. Uh, and they found in Hong Kong that nearly 70% of classroom talk consists of the teacher asking a question, nominating a student to answer the question, the student answering the question, and the teacher providing feedback. That is the IRF exchange. 70% of the classroom talk is IRF exchanges. And those are the kinds of exchanges like how many fingers have I got that you don't actually hear in the real world. Nobody in the real world says, or very rarely would say, how many fingers have I got? Yeah? Or do I have a nose on my face? They, those kinds of questions. Uh, or what's the past tense of go? It's not the sort of questions we ask in the real world. Yet 70% of classroom talk consists of these exchanges. So here we can see how would it be different if we took, if we extended those conversations? How many fingers have you got? Five, good, ask me. How many fingers have you got? Five, good, ask Khaled. How many fingers have you got? Five, good, et cetera. You can get a lot of classroom mileage out of that exchange by getting different students to ask the same question, yeah? But as we've seen, it's not authentic. It's swimming on dry land. Yeah? It's pretend swimming. It's pretend talking. As opposed to sequence B, how many brothers have you got? Five. Five. Wow. Who's the oldest? Walid. Oh, how old is he? 27. Is he? What does he do? He's an engineer. Really? Okay. Ask Khaled. Walid asked Khaled, how many brothers have you got? Yeah, and so on and so on and so on. So what we've got here is something much more approaching, approaching real conversation. Um, and this is not to say, well, but let me move on. Let me just uh, quote Leo Van Leer on this uh, topic, because uh, he says that these kinds of sequence A, you know, this kind of conversation, how many fingers have you got, gives um, reduces students' opportunities to exercise initiative or to develop a sense of control and self-regulation. Yeah? So they have little control over the discourse. They have little control over their own uh, language use. They have no ownership. They're not empowered. These are all really restricted by this IRF format. This is not to say it's always bad. I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't ask display questions, but if it's only display questions, then perhaps students are getting a limited opportunities to practice real swimming. Um, and also it depends partly on how you respond in the feedback move. There's a difference between who's it about? It's about Phil Collins' life. Yeah, it's about Phil Collins. Yeah. So the teacher's simply repeating in a sense what the student's saying. What about this though? If we changed that F 
move slightly and said, it's about, who's it about? It's about Phil Collins' life. Yeah. How do you know that? How do you know that? Now, that's a real question. Yeah? And it's, it's a great question because it throws the responsibility back on the learner to say, well, because it says in the text, blah, blah, blah. And in fact, the teacher does say that in the film. If you remember, she says, how do you know he was a good uh, drummer? How, because it says so in the text. But if you asking questions like, how do you know that changes the quality of the interaction considerably. So it's not to say that IRF exchanges are bad. Nevertheless, if, if, says Leo Van Leer again, if true conversational teaching is going to break out of the IRF mold, uh, and if it is to allow students to develop their own voice, to explore and invest in their agenda, and to learn to choose, plan their own thoughts, action. Yeah? It must break out of the IRF mold, yeah? into the real questions, real conversation. So let's look at an example, an example of that. This is from my same students, um, this course. So this is another trainee teacher, in-service trainee. And this is, the, uh, this is the transcript that she made of an elementary class that's been looking at the language of suggestions. You know, so they've been doing the languages of suggestions like let's, what about, etc. And then at this stage, the teacher is asking them to make some suggestions. And one of them says, what about go to mountains? And the teacher says, what about, what about going to mountains? Says the student correcting the grammar. We can do barranking. The other students laugh. The teacher says, what's barranking? Is a sport. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but what do you do exactly? Why? Mm -hmm. This is the students trying to explain. Yeah, you have a river, a small river, and 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 goes down. Yeah, says the teacher. Goes down. Yeah, because the students just made a gesture. Yeah, you have a small river, and she says goes down. Yes, as a cataract. Ah, okay, a waterfall. Okay, so cataract is a false friend in Spanish. Uh, what they really, she knows that, yeah, catarata is not exactly what they probably mean. It's probably more like a waterfall. What's a waterfall, Manel? Can you give me an example of famous waterfall? She draws on the board. Students says like Niagara. Okay, so what do you do with the waterfall? Ask the teacher. You go down, what, in a boat? No, 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 no. With a, como se dice cuerda? How do you say rope in Spanish? Another student answers that question, says cord. Mm, ah, no, here's another false friend. No, rope, a cord. Is smaller, like at the window. Yeah? Uh, rope, rope, you go down rope and waterfall. You wear black clothes, special clothes, teacher, special clothes, she corrects the pronunciation. She says, this sounds dangerous. Is it dangerous? No, no, it's in summer, no much water. Sorry, pocket, po little water, river is not. Ah, okay. And you've done this? What's it called in Spanish? She says to them, yeah? Barranquismo. You see, so when they said barranking, they're kind of inventing this word that doesn't in fact exist based on the Spanish word, barranquismo. In English, they asked her, she's like, I don't know. I'd have to ask somebody. It is good, you come, come as do, what do you, how do you, and this is the student trying to retrieve this language of suggestion. How do you say, how do you say, ah, let's go together. And she says, ooh, I don't think so. So you see what's happening here, so different from the Phil Collins text, is that here it's the students who are teaching the teacher about something. And all her questions, or the bulk of them, are real questions. What's the ranking? Because she doesn't know. She said herself, I don't know. I never heard of this sport. Yeah? And she says, what do you do exactly? So this is real questions, real questions. Yeah, and that is what barranking is, if you didn't know. It's called canyoning uh, in English. But I think this is a wonderful example of, a, of, of classroom interaction which mixes teaching and conversation. So the students are having a conversation about something that she doesn't know about, the teacher doesn't know about, but she's not completely having the conversation. Notice that she... From time to time, corrects pronunciation. She supplies the right word. She corrects the wrong word, etc. So what we have here 
is a kind of meeting of lesson and conversation that they are not necessarily uh, incompatible. Again, as Anne Bannock says, the classroom may be viewed as an ecological environment in which the lesson and the conversation are relational to each other, needing one another. Yeah? Not like Jorge's wedding. Uh, we don't want to talk about that because page 56 is more important. The lesson is more important than conversation. Yeah? Pretend swimming is better than real swimming. But no, maybe they can be combined. And they can be combined through the way that the teacher talks to the learners, the kinds of questions the teacher asks. Steve Walsh, who's made a big study of classroom interaction, says the role of the teacher is central to co-constructing a dialogue. And this could be describing the barranking lesson, co-constructing yeah, between the students and the teacher, a dialogue in which learning opportunities are maximized. Yeah, learning the difference between cataract and waterfall, learning how to pronounce special clothes through the use of specific interactional strategies to scaffold, shape, and clarify learner contributions. To scaffold. And if you look at the title of the talk, I use the word scaffolding. What is scaffolding? Well, scaffolding, as you know, in real life is this. It's the structure that you put up around a building when you're building it and you take it down when the building is finished. Yeah. And this is my definition of scaffolding. And scaffolding happens in everywhere. I mean, uh, in any kind of classroom, but also outside of classrooms, when, when learners, children, for example, are learning a new skill, they get support. They get support from somebody who's able to give them support. They get moral support, but they get physical support. They get cognitive support while they're learning the skill. You can see it happening here with this mother, child's learning how to ride a bike. The mother is physically supporting the child. She knows how bikes are ridden, yeah? She knows what's uh, best done. And she knows that at some point she's going to have to withdraw her support, yeah? which she does here. And you can see she's no longer physically supporting the child. The child is, is freewheeling, as it were. So learning, according to this kind of view of learning, is a process which goes from being regulated by somebody else, the mother in this case, to being able to do it yourself from other regulation to self-regulation. And you can see it happening when children learn their first language. Uh, again, the mother playing a key role here. So we, here we have a little scene where uh, Mark, who's 20 months old, his first language is English. Uh, they're in the kitchen and the hot water uh, boiler has just made a popping noise yeah, as it's just reignited. And little Mark says, oh, popped on. Remember, he's 20 months old, yeah? So he's still... And the mother, who's busy doing whatever, says, pardon? It popped on. It popped on to the mother? Yeah. What did? Uh, the fire on. Oh, the fire. Yeah, pop the fi fi fire popped it. Fire. Oh, yes, the fire popped on, didn't it? Yeah. A wonderful little sequence there where the child is supported, yeah, to produce a much longer run of words at the end yeah pop the fire popped it fire etc then he was able to do at the beginning uh using subject pronouns etc why because the mother is asking the right questions yeah she constructs or she co-constructs or she scaffolds little marks developing language through conversation and we see that happening we saw that happening in the baranking uh, episode. So, for example, the teacher asks a real question, what's the ranking? Is a sport? Yes, but what do you do exactly? Yeah. So she's asking two questions here. The, yeah, what is it? And then, okay, but, and then she asks for an elaboration. So she's scaffolding the talk by asking these two real questions. Or further on here, students make a mistake with confusing cataract and waterfall. So she stops 
And she does, she writes the word, she elicits uh, an example. She even has time to draw a picture. Yeah? So that is, she scaffolds that little moment. It's an instructional moment. She's stepping outside of the conversation to be the teacher before she goes back into the conversation. And then the same thing further down, rope, rope, window, cord, etc. So what I'm arguing here is this ecological balance, as it was described, between teaching and real talk can be done uh, and should be done because it's uh, good for language learning, but it's also, it brings the class alive. It turns the class into a, a more authentic language using situation. It's more like the swimming pool rather than the dry land. Uh, so just um, to finish, uh, let me quote some advice from um, Claire Cranch in an article some many years ago uh, on the same topic, suggests ways that we can combine teaching and conversation in the way that this teacher here has managed to do. Um, so, oh yes, I mean, there's another example of scaffolding. What's it called in Spanish? So is that using the learner's first language to, um, to support the learning and, uh, and to, in a sense, um, to learn something herself. Yeah? So the students are teaching the teacher about something that she doesn't know about. So here's Claire Crouch's advice. First of all, she says to the teacher, tolerate silences. Yeah, wait. When you ask a question, count to five. Refrain from filling the gaps between turns. Yeah, don't just fill it because you want to keep moving on. This will put pressure on students to initiate turns if you tolerate silence. Yeah. And students initiating turns, yeah can bring up, can give them a, a degree of agency or power, if you like, in the classroom to control the discourse. So the student who says, I got married, has now got control of the discourse momentarily, if the teacher is prepared to let him. And she goes on to say, encourage students to sustain their speech beyond one or two sentences. Uh, I mean, a lot of the classroom talk, if we go back to the Phil Collins example, the students are not even producing full, uh, full sentences. So what does he do? Singer. Yeah? And what does he play? He drums. Yeah? The students are just producing language at the level of words until the teacher gets them to the point where they can produce the, the structure of the day. He was always playing the drums. Yeah? But that even that is only one sentence. So again, think, how can we extend the learner's contributions as the teacher, the ranking teacher does when she says, okay, what is, right, it's a sport. Yes, but what do you do exactly? Uh, so encouraging them to produce longer turns. Do not use a student's short utterance as a springboard for your own lengthy turn. This is where we see that teachers, even in these kind of recitative, uh, exchanges tend to dominate and do most of the speaking. And finally, she says, keep the number of display, well, this is not funny, keep the number of display questions to a minimum. Yeah, the display questions, how many fingers have I got? The more genuine the request for information, the more natural the discourse. Yeah, more genuine the request for information, how many brothers have you got? Yeah. What did you do at the weekend? Of course, if you're going to ask genuine questions, then you need to respond in a genuine way. So what did you do at the weekend? I got married. Oh, turn to page 56. That is not an authentic interaction. Uh, and then she goes on. Pay attention to the message of students' utterances. Yeah? What are they saying? Not just to the form in which they're cast. Yeah? It's not about correction, initially at least. Uh, so the student who says... Um, 
So what did you do at the weekend? Uh, I go to the mountains. Ah, you went to the mountains, really? That must have been interesting. Did you go alone or did you go? You see what I mean? Even though, the, and then she says, by the way, it's I pass, not I go to the mountains. I went to the mountains. But she focuses on the meaning before the form. Because if you focus constantly on the form, it's going to discourage the students from taking those kinds of initiatives. Um, and then she says, another piece of advice, make extensive use of natural feedback. Natural feedback, yeah? not just good, good, right, okay, good. That, hmm, interesting, I thought so too. Yeah? Rather than evaluating and judging every student utterance following its delivery. And she says at the same time, do not overpraise. Uh, do not treat uh, the um, students as if they were somehow um, you know, incapacitated. Don't overpraise. And that's Claire Crouch's advice, as I said, way back from 1985, but I think it's as true now as it is uh, then. And the final quote I want to share with you is, again, Leo van Leer, who I've quoted already today, uh, has written extensively on classroom interaction. And his argument, and my argument would be that, you know, we can try to change teaching in all sorts of ways. We can change the course book. We can uh, change the method. We can change the technology. We can do all these things. But unless we change the way we talk, to the learners, we've changed nothing. Yeah? Different course book, but same page 56 conversation, yeah? Swimming on dry land. So Van Leer says, curriculum in innovation you know, can only come about through a fundamental change in the way educators and students interact with one another. Reform, that is innovation, thus occurs from the Bottom up, yeah, from the bottom up, from the way we ask questions, one pedagogical action at a time, one step at a time. Uh, so my advice to any new teachers particularly is if you want to engage your learners, then think about, about the way you ask them questions and also think about getting them to ask you questions or each other, real questions. So that's it from me uh i'm gonna stop there and um i'm another did you i haven't been checking the chat but uh did you grab any questions thank you so very much for this thank you so very much scott for this wonderful talk enlightening as always and uh, we appreciate that now the floor is open for questions if you have any questions you can put them in the chat and meanwhile i have gathered some of the questions and saving is Zenalova, I think, you know, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. She's from Baku, Azerbaijan. She asked how scaffolding techniques could change in online classes. Well, yes, uh, <laughs> this is a great question. And I was kind of like, hoping that somebody would ask it because obviously teaching online creates a very different uh, ecology if you like, than in the real classroom. And it's, and it's very challenging uh, for those reasons. I think it's harder, uh, much harder to, especially with a large class. I mean, it's hard with a large class anyway in a real classroom. And I'm sure uh, some of you will be thinking about that. You know, if I've got 68-year-olds, how am I going to have a real conversation? We can come to that point in a minute. But it is, uh, it's made even more difficult when you're online. And it's made even more difficult when the students don't have their cameras on. So it's very, very difficult even to know whether the students are physically present, uh, let alone to be able to gauge, to monitor their degree of interaction. Uh, it's, uh, and this is why um, there is a tendency at least, and it's well documented that in online teaching, Teachers, even though in their real classrooms, they're very interactive and conversational, when they get online, they become like me now, the lecturer, you know, giving a talk because it's easier to manage. 
uh, and interactions are. But I think there are, I think we've all learned ways that we're be of becoming more interactive, just using the few tools that there are. And I think particularly using the chat box like we are now is a great way of keeping the conversation going and throwing questions out and getting students to answer them in the chat, even if they can't all answer them through voice. But, you know, this is something that, um, as I say, we're, we're still learning about the potential and the problems and the challenges involved in online teaching. But it does, I think we just have to be more rigorous and make sure that we're not becoming, uh, we're not becoming like the teacher, the Jorge's wedding teacher, just constantly referring to page 56. I'll take Cynthia's question now because it just flashed by. It's about, because there's another good question uh, about uh, what if, what if uh, uh, some learners don't want to uh, interact in this kind of way? Um, I'm just trying to find it. Yeah, what should we do if some of the students don't want to actively participate? Uh, Yes, I mean, obviously, again, as you get to know your students, you'll find that there are students who will be more forthcoming than others. So we know that. Uh, and maybe that's for the reason why that um, the teacher didn't let Jorge talk about his wedding, because he's always talking about something. Uh, we want to involve all the students. But I think one way, at least, is uh, in a real classroom is to take the pressure off students by putting them into pairs and groups. And that's one of the great advantages of pair and group work that they are less exposed. Yeah, they're just exposed to their partner or the other members of the group and that they can then have a conversation kind of in hiding as it were. So put them into groups. You've got five minutes, find out as much as you can about each other's weekend and then get ready to report to the class. And then the person who reports on the group work can be a volunteer. Uh, so again, you're not putting pressure necessarily on individuals, but pair and group works. You know, I always tell teachers when they're being assessed by uh, an outside assessor, which is often the case in um, courses like the Delta course. So they have an observer come in to evaluate the lesson. Don't start the lesson by asking the students questions because the students will be embarrassed and uh, inhibited because of the presence of, uh, because they know that the teacher's being evaluated and also because uh, there's an unfamiliar person in the room. Start the lesson by putting them straight into groups or pairs, and that takes the pressure off everybody so the students can talk about, give them a task. Yeah? Neil, my colleague, remember Neil on the train, he, every lesson begins with students in groups and they have to talk about something they've read or heard or seen in the last, since the last lesson. They've read in the newspaper, perhaps, they've seen on television, they've heard from a friend, anything. Yeah? They go into groups, they share. Now, because he does this every lesson, they come prepared. If one student's not prepared, it doesn't matter so much because the others will have something. Teachers going around, helping with vocabulary, listening, and then maybe he says, oh, that's a good story. Jorge, tell us your story about your wedding, you know, after they've done the group work. So every lesson begins with the group work, and there's always something that you can pull out of that, whether it's talking about barranquismo, whether it's talking about Jorge's wedding, or whether it's talking about their real opinions about Phil Collins. So that would be one uh, answer to that question, Cynthia, is take the pressure off them by using pair and group work. Don't insist. And I think the other thing is you give students the right to pass if you don't want to talk about this, even if it's maybe a, it might not seem like a very threatening topic. How many brothers have you got? But if somebody's recently experienced a, um, a death in the family, the last thing they will want to talk about is their immediate family. And they should be allowed, therefore, to say, no, I pass. Don't push them. And the other thing is have them um, listen in to other people's conversations and then report back. Yeah? So they don't have to talk about themselves, yeah, but you have a conversation with your partner about your weekend. Now, Cynthia, tell us what uh, Maria did in her weekend. So she's, Cynthia's talking about Maria, not about herself. They may be less inhibited. 
The other thing is, of course, students are inhibited because they don't have the language. So, um, <laughs> thank you, Cynthia. They don't have the language. So we've got to give them the scaffolding, the support in the language. So the student who wants to say, I went to the mountains in the weekend, but doesn't know the word for mountains. Well, let them ask. Yeah? There's no shame in saying, how do you say mountains in English? Como se dice montaña? And so on. Okay, um, any other questions that you think I should address? Um, yes, there's one question from Ariana, and she asked that, uh, could you share your advice about dealing with socialized mistakes? Should I correct them immediately? I give a uh, postponed feedback. Language learning takes time. It takes years, even the first language. Um, you are, uh, students are always going to make mistakes and some of those mistakes will take a long time to kind of disappear and some of them will never, after all, um, uh, especially for older learners, um, the, there's not a lot of time for learning the second language and it's never going to be perfect. Uh, and we have to be a little bit tolerant here. Um, we need to remind learners that uh, that's not the standard. The student says, I go to the mountains last week. Okay, fine, but past tense. We need to be reminding them. Uh, and also uh, for the others who are watching, yeah, who are participating passively in the lesson, they can learn things from the corrections. But they must be done in a spirit which is friendly, encouraging, and accepting. We must accept the fact that students have, will crawl before they walk and walk before they run. Um, and also accept the fact that uh, second language learning is an endless process. Yeah? There's no end state, just as first language learning is too, for that matter. We're always learning new words and learners are never at the end yeah, of the learning trajectory. There's always something new to learn and to get right. And the other thing is, of course, we need to be um, cognizant. We need to be aware of what the learners' needs are. If they have to pass an exam where the focus is on accuracy, yeah, well, then they need feedback on their accuracy if they want to pass the exam. But if they're learning uh, English simply to communicate uh, in a kind of informal context through social media, for example, then, you know, it doesn't really matter if they have uh, non-target-like forms, that is to say, with their language still has strong influence, both in the pronunciation and the grammar of their first language. Um, Amanala, anything else that you caught in passing? Or if I just scroll back. Okay, so, yeah. Uh, there was also another question from uh, Rajani Shankar, she's from India, and she asked that how can teacher talk introduce learners to contemporary discourses in conservative context? How can learner talk, sorry? Uh, how can a teacher talk introduce learners to contemporary discourses in conservative context? I don't know. In which if, context? Uh, in conservative context. I don't okay. know what you know he means from conservative context, but yeah. Uh, yeah, what well, insofar as I understand the question, I mean, I think um, obviously, well, first of all, I need to make the point that teacher talk, teacher learner and interaction uh, is going to um, uh, obviously vary according to the learner's level, and there's only so much interaction you can do but it's surprising how much you can do even with beginners i think that's something one thing you, that you learn just as with little mark remember in the kitchen popped on i mean he's got very 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 little vocabulary let alone grammar yet he's able to have a conversation because the, the the mother is is co-constructing it as you go up uh the levels of course it becomes in some ways easier but some ways harder because you've got the challenge of uh uh of dealing with as the last question of dealing with fossilized mistakes you know how many things are you going to deal with in the kind of conversation you've got a lot more data a lot more content 
uh, in these conversations. One thing I like to do, incidentally, is have students have a conversation, going back to this suggestion that they go into pairs uh, to start the lesson, is instead of having the conversation by in speaking about their weekend, have them write it, yeah? Have them write a question, give it to their neighbor, they write the answer backwards and forwards. So it's like texting, yeah, but on pencil and paper. Then you've got the advantage there that you've got uh, you've got the text written down. Yeah, so it's it's easier to take that away and to provide feedback on less with less pressure on you to be constantly thinking uh, which which errors to correct, etc. In the heat of the moment. Um, and also from that data, you can find out, you get a good, uh, you know, glimpse of where learners are at, what particular problems they're having, if it's the past tense, if it's prepositions and that kind of thing. For more sp specialized uh, la language learners, you know, learners who are studying um, English as a special, um, sp for specific purposes like business or technology or whatever, the same thing applies. And in fact, uh, giving them the opportunity to present to their colleagues. Yeah? So again, taking the focus off the teacher, but doing kind of you know, what we call show and tell activities with children, but do them with university students or whatever, they present on a particular topic, maybe what they're studying in their, for their dissertation or whatever, they present, to the class and there's a question and answer after the presentations. It's a fantastic experience and very good training for their academic or professional skills. As long as the presentation is ideally spoken, not read aloud. Yeah? What you don't want is students just reading from a prepared text. It must be, they must be speaking. They can do all the preparation they want, but they should be doing what I'm doing now, which is speaking, eye contact, uh, with the rest of the class, particularly with the question and answer session. So I'm not sure if I did answer that question, but I would say that all the, all the way up, irrespective of the kind of uh, classes you're teaching, you need to provide opportunities for learner-initiated discourse, yeah, where the focus is on the learners, the topics that are, 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 um, are generated by the learners themselves. I'm conscious that we're ne nearly out of time. Um, yeah. Uh, so if, if we could, mm -hmm. if you could ask this, this uh, you know, take this question from Mervyn. He asked, "What is a good way to reduce uh, a teacher talk time with very low level group of students?" Because this is because I have an experience of teacher having most talk time with these level of students. Yes, um, a very good question. I, and, and, and I think this is where with lower level students, beginners, etc., this is where the danger is, the temptation for the teacher to fill all the available space. Um, what, uh, I mean, there's various, I could describe in various um, techniques or activities, but I think one thing to remember is that students know more language as a class than they do individually. So anything that they can do collaboratively uh, will generate surprising amount of language. So, I mean, I, I've talked before about my Time Magazine lesson where I put up a picture for the beginners class. This was in teaching in Egypt. I put up a picture from the Time Magazine, the cover, and I sat down and I let them try to describe the story behind the picture yeah, without saying anything. And between them, they were able to kind of find enough vocabulary. So then I let one of them go to the board and write a summary of all the words, et cetera, that they had come up with in describing this picture. And then having done that, so I've done nothing, yeah, just provided the prompt, the stimulus. Then I take all these words and I put them into a text. Yeah, I talk through it with them so that they, their story, their text is reformulated uh, in more target-like language, but it comes out of the words that they supply or the minimal, just like Mark's mother scaffolded his conversation about the um, heater. Great. Uh, so can we take uh, last one or two questions? 
Ah, uh, yeah, you can take a couple more. Sure, sure, sure. So, yeah, uh, Saima from Turkey, she asked, can feature talks provide enough input for second language pragmatic development? Yes, I think this is the you know, pragmatic development, i.e. how to use language in, in real context. It's, by reducing the number of display questions, by asking real questions, you're already changing the pragmatics of the classroom. You're making it more real, more lifelike. It's a swimming pool, not dry land. Um, now, you could argue that it's a, it's a rather narrow kind of register if it's just having conversations about the weekend all the time, et cetera, but it needn't be. It can be conversations about topics which are not just personal yeah they could be professional we've mentioned that already academic and so on depending on the level and the needs of the students but also don't forget role playing i mean uh dialogue building role playing the more traditional classroom techniques where people play roles so they are actually uh you know making requests asking for favors complaining uh, apologizing doing that in the context of a simulation or a role play they are getting practice in the different kind of pragmatic um, uses of language. Any other questions there, Amanala? Yeah, uh, okay, we'll just talk to when the stage focuses on training students to have natural pronunciation of a target language, wouldn't asking additional questions for the sake of a meaningful interaction hinder the stage, stage M? Uh, yes. Uh, hang on. I can see that one. Um, well, um, we can do two things at once in the language classroom. I mean, it's possible to, and I think that's the point of the lesson about barranking, that the teacher was having a conversation or the students were having a conversation, but the teacher was correcting the pronunciation when it came up. And arguably, it's those at the moment kind of corrections that are more memorable because they're related to the, the language that the students are actually producing rather than coming out of the course book or something more artificial. So I don't think there's a contradiction in having a meaningful interaction and at the same time focusing on aspects of language. Now, the question is, if the aspect of language you want to focus on is something that's been pre-selected, yeah, because it's in the course book, it's on page 56, it's the past tense, let's say, that's in the syllabus, then, uh, that, then the question, or, or if it's a feature of pronunciation, then, of course, the question is, can you manipulate <laughs> the classroom talk so it gets to the point where the students will need the past tense. Now, the past tense is relatively easy. I always ask teachers this, when would, if you had to pre present the past simple, would you do it before the weekend or after the weekend? Now, obviously, after the weekend, because you've got something you can talk about. So you start the conversation about the weekend and say, ah, hang on, we've got a problem here. We're all using the present, but we're talking about the past, so let's just rethink here. What do we need? We need to change go to when we need to change sit to sat etc if you're teaching going to uh, going to go going to buy going to see would you do it before the weekend or after the weekend you do it before the weekend because you've got something to talk about you say tell us about your plans for the weekend ah you're going to the mountains you're going to go skiing okay fine etc so yeah there's ways of manipulating to a certain extent the classroom discourse so that it fits in to the uh syllabus if you've got a pre-selected syllabus, which 99% of teachers have. But we used to think, you see, this is the teachers teaching Jorge, and she says, what did you do at the weekend? And really what she's doing here is she's not actually interested. She's just covering while the lesson starts because students are arriving late and they're getting their books out. And so she, she said, well, you know, we'll have a chat. She also probably thinks that page 56 is more important than the chat. And we used to think that, that chat was just chat and it's not very important. We now know that, like little Mark in the kitchen, chat is how you learn a language. It's through conversation. You know, we don't learn language and then have conversations. We have conversations and through those conversations, we learn the language. That's how we learned our first language. 
We didn't go to school to learn our first language. We learned it on our mother's knee, chatting. Huh? And the same thing can apply to, I, I think, arguably, to a uh, to second language learning. Although we don't have very to insightful, in. great. So, <laughs> Yulia asked, could you please advise uh, some of the ways uh, for decreasing anxiety when speaking in public? For speaking in public. Uh, yep. But uh, for lowering a decreasing anxiety. Ah, the anxiety. Uh, practice. Uh, you know, the, one of the things about online learning we've learned, I think, is that there's lots that students can do outside of the classroom using apps and things. I think we've got a lot better at um, uh, uh, directing learners to resources that they can use uh, for uh, out of class learning, both of things like vocabulary using digital um, flashcards like Quizlet, but also for practicing speaking. And I've forgotten the name of it, but there's a uh, software, an app uh, where you can record yourself and upload the recording so the rest of the teacher can listen to it and the rest of the class can listen to it or see it if it's a video recording. What's it called? Um, hugely, Flip, no, what's it called? Flip grid, Padlet. Yeah, yes, yes, <laughs> that's it. So getting students to do a homework assignment, which is spoken, not written, using Flipgrid, whatever it's called, um, that's fantastic because you can only, be, you know, just say it has to be, it doesn't have to be long, just a minute. Tell me about your favorite hobby, yeah? Or tell me about uh, an interesting book you've read or a film you've seen, et cetera, yeah? But tell me, yeah, this is the important thing. Don't write it down and read it aloud. I'm not interested. I can read that. You can send me the text. I want to hear it, yeah? I want you to tell me. And I can, I'm, I know when people are reading aloud, so don't try to fool me. Uh, you can put notes down, you can put words down, but I want you to, if you don't get it right the first time, erase it, do it again, do it again, do it again, do it as many times until you are happy. This is fantastic practice. Takes the anxiety thing, do it at home, nobody's watching, they can erase it if they don't like it, and then finally when they're happy, they can upload it and their classmates can listen. That's a fantastic uh, device, one of the most useful things for, for language learning purposes anybody's ever invented. Bokaroo, says Patricia. Well, this is another one, exactly. Yeah. So there's a lot of this yeah. stuff out there that um, we can point Thank students Thank you so to much, break. Scott. So any final message for our community? Um, to <laughs> continue asking the questions, uh, to continue meeting together, uh, forming a global community of like-minded, interested teachers is the best possible thing. You know, when I first started teaching, uh, we didn't have the internet, clearly. We didn't have email. There was very little means of communicating outside of our own local institution. But the institution that I worked in had a teacher's room, and that was the best possible thing. The teacher's room was our forum, yeah? That's where we talked to each other, all 20 of us or whatever, exchanged lesson plans, talked about particular students, asked questions about grammar, et cetera, gave each other masses of support. That was the best training I ever had as a teacher. We can simulate that same kind of degree of interaction um, through online groups like, like this one. So I, again, reiterate my thanks to you, uh, my congratulations for the, um, this wonderful initiative, uh, the proof being the number of people who have turned out today and the quality of the questions that they've been asking. So, Amanala, thank you, thank you very you much. Thank so you very much. It's my pleasure. Players are all mine. Day. Yes, play, players are all mine. You can't, you know, uh, I can't explain my excitement. For someone like me who have been, you know, reading your work and quoting your sources and undergraduate assignments and, uh, you know, talking to you just <laughs> live on, on this special day when it's my birthday, you know, I'm on the seventh cloud. <laughs> I will, well, this is my present to you then, yeah. Amanala. <laughs> okay. Thank you so bye. much. Thank bye, you so everybody. Much. Thanks, a Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks a lot. And uh, for the certificate,
uh, let me tell you that uh, this uh, webinar was completely free and we do not charge for uh, webinars, uh, but for certificate, there is reasonable price and uh, rupees 300 for Pakistani nationals and uh, $5 for internationals. So if you want to uh, know the payment method, you can email on info.edwebinars at the rate of gmail.com. And uh, for our future webinars, uh, please keep following us. We are available on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and of course, uh, YouTube channel. This recording will also be available at uh, Teacher Development Webinars uh, YouTube channel. So you can share it and rewatch it. I appreciate your presence and attendance. Thank you so very much. Be safe. Bye-bye.